Glad to welcome you to this day live, this Sunday talk show here on Arise News Channel. With me are Nemeka Obiareri, a certified investment banking executive, uh, as well as Chike Achude, uh, public affairs. Actually, with me is Malam, uh, Ma is Malam Yusuf here in Abuja studio. And then, of course, I have Johnson Kolawole in Lagos, if I am very correct. Gentlemen, you are welcome to the studio. Uh, thank you for joining me. All right, uh, let's start uh, with uh, the, in an apparent move to rein in exorbitant travel expenditure, President Bola Metinibu has issued a sweeping directive slashing his future entourage for both domestic and international events by a staggering 60%. Well, this directive applies to all federal MDAs, the Office of the President, the Office of the Vice President, the First Lady, and the wife of the Vice President. Still, as correspondent, Adesu Omoron reports. It's crunch time, and fostering fiscal responsibility in the corridors of power is the aim of Nigeria's President Bola Tinubu, who has come under mounting scrutiny over the cost of official trips in the last seven months. A prevalent trend among top government officials in Africa is their penchant for extensive travel with large delegations, despite the strain on their supposedly ailing economies. In the past seven months, both President Bola Tinubu and Vice President Kashim Shatima have collectively visited 16 countries, defending these trips as vital for driving foreign direct investment into Nigeria. But critics question the economic impact particularly given the size of the accompanying delegations. Today, Tinubu has announced sweeping financial austerity measures affecting all federal ministries, departments and agencies, the office of the president, the office of the vice president and that of the first lady. Four members of their staff, uh, appointees and the like, uh, will be allowed to travel with a minister on an official trip. For heads of agency, that will be limited to two members of staff allowed to travel on an official trip. Furthermore, the, the numbers that the president has now approved uh, for official travel with him that will apply to his principal staff uh, are as follows. On international trips, the president has directed that no more than 20 individuals be allowed uh, to travel with him. That number will be cut down to five in the case of the First Lady. Additionally, the number in the entourage on official international trips for the Vice President will be cut to five. The number that will be placed uh, as a limit uh, on the wife of the Vice President is also five. These cost-cutting measures extend to travels within the country. In terms of local trips, the president has approved a new limit of 25 members of staff to accompany him on domestic trips within the country. Uh, the office of the first lady is now limited to 10 staff members uh, to accompany her on official trips within the country. The vice president will be limited to 15 members of staff on official trips within the country while his wife will be limited to 10 members of staff on official trips uh, within the country. You will find that the numbers on international trips are less than those allowed on domestic trips. This is because international trips are far more expensive. And an additional caveat that extensive security delegations accompanying the president and the vice president during local trips will cease to exist. When Mr. President or the Vice President travels to any state within the country, the massive bills that accrued due to allowances and ESTA code for security detail coming from Abuja going and traveling into those states will be massively cut due to the directive of the President that the security outfits within states, whether it be police, DSS, or branches of the military, will frontline his protective detail when he travels to those states. This decision follows the controversy surrounding the federal government's contentious 1,411 delegates to the United Nations Annual Climate Summit, COP28, in Dubai about a month ago. 
It remains to be seen if President Tinubu's actions align with his words and what consequences may await the falters. Adesua Omoruan, Arise News. The President Bola Mertinibu has ordered the suspension of all programs administered by the National Social Investment Program Agency. According to Shegu Imohosen, who is Director of Information Office of the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, this move follows the ongoing investigation of alleged malfeasance in managing the agency and its programs. The statement reads in part, quote, All four programs administered by NSIPA, including NPAR Programme, Conditional Cash Transfer Program, Government Enterprise and Empowerment Program, and Homegrown School Feeding Program have been suspended for six weeks in the first instance. All right, for greater focus on those presidential interventions, I'm now being joined first in the studio here in Abuja by Malam Baba Yusuf. He's a strategist, policy analyst, and Group Chief Executive Officer of Global Investment and Trade Company. And from Arise Lagos Studio, we shall be hearing from Kolawale Johnson, who is a Due Process Advocate and Head Directorate of Research and Strategy Act for Positive Transformation Initiatives. Gentlemen, it is my pleasure to have you, both of you, on the program this day live. I will start with you, uh, Yusuf, uh, uh, Malam Yusuf, here in the studio. Mm. Um, let me even start where uh, Adeswa uh, kind of stopped, and that is to see whether it's just a talk and not a walk. What, whether he stopped, whether he will walk the talk, and then if there is a disobedience, I'm not talking about slashing of the anti-right domestic international by 60%. I mean, you will talk about that 60%. Uh, what do you see about that? What I hear will walk the talk one. And for those who will not adhere, whether he will be able to wield the big stick. Thank you, Indy, for having me. Um, first question, answer to the first question is, I, I believe he will. Uh, the fact that the, some very key steps uh, President Tinubu took uh, right and on the return from the Yuletide holidays shows that um, the political will consciousness of Mr. President has been pricked. Uh, suspension of the minister uh, and ordering an investigation, suspension of the coordinator of the um, National Social Investment Program. Uh, are very, very big steps taken by Mr. President. And I don't see, you know, him taking these steps if he's not ready to go the whole hog. I mean, the next steps also confirm that suspension of the NSIP and also setting up of this uh, ministerial committee to do undertake an audit. These are all indicators of a man that wants to walk the talk. Uh, that being said, we will wait and see the outcomes. We've heard the terms of uh, reference given to the ministers. What I have not heard so far is the timeline given to this committee, you know, to undertake this assignment, because that is also very key to see, to, for us now to hazard a guess as to what, what, what will happen to that program uh, going forward, you know. All right. Uh, let me come to you straight away, uh, Johnson, Okolawole Rada. Uh, let's address the issue of what you make of the 60% cut in travel, both domestic and, of course, international, and then the question of suspension of the programs. Six weeks in the first instance, what will happen to those who have been enjoying uh, or benefiting, let me put it that way, from this program? What, 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 what do you think? Um, <clears throat> uh, some times ago, in my quest uh, to to have uh, something in uh, organizational psychology, I stumbled on uh, a professor of uh, of that field, um, and he said that uh, he said something very profound: that followers who tell the truth and leaders who listen are, are unbeatable combination. When Nigerians 
talk and her leaders listen, it's actually good for the country. When the president came uh, on the 29th of May and announced that subsidy is gone, you know, some of us clapped for that because we've been advocating for that for too long. And um, it was a reform that was most needed to set the nation aright. We were going, you know, on that, on that terrible uh, um, um, precipice on the edge of uh, a huge debt burden that was taking the country away, unfortunately. Uh, 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 if we're getting close to a point, in fact, to what, to what you call debt crisis. So internal reform was not avoidable. We needed to make that. But again, we shouted that, uh, haven't done that. Uh, the people are the one, you know, you've, you, you know, sacrificing according to what the government wants us to do. But again, it appears the government, re, you know, returned the subsidy for the government officials. So we created two halves. We divided the nation into two, uh, uh, the haves and the have not. So the people, uh, the ones sacrificing, were those in government, are actually not sacrificing. We saw an over bloated government. We saw, you know, the continuous waste uh, 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 in the cost of uh, uh, in uh, in a, you know governance and the uh, and the cost of governance not going down. So we shouted that this much needed reform that this nation, you know, it desperately needs may be dragged down if the government does not also reform itself. You know, both structural reform, uh, organizational reform system reform and all that. So, uh, you know, that we clamor for. So the fact that the president listened and, uh, you know, and he has, he, he has taken this step for me, I want to clap, first of all, you know, for the initiative, also expecting that we won't stop, you know, right here. We'll also be able to uh, look at other areas where we can reduce cost of governance. But this is key because if you look at what officials collect when they go for foreign trips, you know, you, you, you will start to imagine if the people we are begging for uh, debt forgiveness will, will listen to us in any case. And unfortunately, uh, uh, we are laboring at this stage uh, 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 on terms that you can't even start to describe. I remember sometimes uh, 2022, uh, the first quarter of the year, uh, then we got some you know, records that came out uh, uh, when we were told that the nation made a total of 1.6 trillion naira in revenue, and we spent a total of 1.9 trillion naira to service debt. Unfortunately, by the year that uh, the time the year was over, Nigeria had done 106 percent of its revenue to service debt, and this was the same country 50 years ago, 1972, that General Gowon came out to say, "Oh, it, Nigeria, the problem is not money; it is how to spend it." But money became a problem, revenue. So to see government officials living large in a situation where we don't even make enough, look at us, look at uh, look at that same year in review. The projected expenditure was at twenty-one point eight trillion naira, but we barely made five point three trillion. And uh, you know, at the end, we we're able to spend only fourteen point six trillion naira. And out of that, how much was the revenue? Five point you know three. Why we service debt with five point six? trillion naira. So the fact is, we know that we need to reduce uh, 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 the waste. And of course, if you want to keep a healthy uh, balance sheet, it is in two ways. You don't just increase your income, you also reduce your expenditure. So reducing expenditure in the cost of governance and all that is what we need at the state. Now, let me go to the NSIP program suspended. You look at poverty rate, you trace it back to 1984, you know, when, when, when we were playing with 20% poverty rate and it went to, you know, 35, 40, until we got to this level that Nigeria became the poverty headquarters of the world. And one thing you would notice is that there is, there is, there is a convergence between corruption and the growth in poverty. So the lo once you see increase in corruption in the system, you see directly increase in poverty rate. Why? Because the money meant for the people to create infrastructure that will drive wealth, to create, uh, 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 to oil the wheel of businesses, entrepreneurship, and all that. The money is being taken away to the purses of few persons. So what you see is that the more, uh, 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 the more we allow the growth of corruption in the system, you know, the more we have the prevalence of poverty. So the NSIP program, 
I don't think has achieved it, uh, uh, the goal of setting it up, not because it wasn't a well thought out program. Social investment anyway, you can't take it out, that you need to take care of the vulnerable, the aged. I remember some years back when Governor Fire me then as a sitting governor was you know, driving uh, 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 a kind of a social window that was paying some money to the elderly monthly. It was, you know, it was uh, I think by some ratio then and the, um, and the uh, research that was done, it was meeting some very critical uh, 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 needs in the system. So when you have social investment like this, you know, the social window taking care of the vulnerable, it is what is, you know, what we should applaud. But when you sit in your house and you hear that, a, I mean, that an official is saying that we have fed people with tens of billions of naira, even during lockdown, you start wondering if, if, if the program is needed in the first instance because of the, you know, the holes we have created. But by the time you look at the entire structure of governance in Nigeria, you notice that we have given the rooms for corruption, not only in NSIP. It is just a unit. It is just for us to see what goes on in the entire structure of government, you know, in the entire uh, 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 governance structure in the country. So suspending NSIP, not for the sake, I mean, not for canceling the program, but for reforming it, reforming its structures and its administrations and all that. It is what we need. So if the reform will also cover the integrity of data so that we know that you can imagine uh, when the governors were discussing with the presidents on how to extend you know some palliative to their state they all disowned the data that was being used by the former you know government on the same system why do you think they didn't allow the fg to come to their state to share because all along it has been political it has been voicemail money all right all right you know, so they didn't want that because they knew that it won't meet yeah. uh, uh, its goals so suspending so it to reform it to achieve its aim i think is a good way to go Okay, so spending it to reform it, to achieve his aim, is a good way to go. That's from Kola. In some quarters, the talk will be, what happens during this law to the people who are supposed to be getting these benefits? And what really, what kind of reforms will be apt now? Because you can't run away from particularly in these times when things are not really laughing at Nigerians, even all over the world. Mm -hmm. So what particular reforms would you be, if the president calls you down and tells you, talk to me about this, what reforms would you be looking at? Thank you very much. First of all, let's just take a step back. The whole thing is about impacts and outcomes, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now, as of 2022, the administration of President uh, Buhari came out to tell us that they have spent 3.7 trillion naira over a course of seven years on social investment and poverty alleviation programs. The same year, the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics stated that of the whole intervention, only about 6.1% of the most vulnerable benefited. It proposes, therefore, from my own simple arithmetic, that if you consider the over 130 million multidimensionally poor Nigerians, this is a drop in the bucket because it's less than 5% of the multidimensionally poor. That is on one aspect. And secondly, the level of opaqueness with regards to the, even the disbursements you know, makes me to even query the 6% brandished by the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics because we hardly see or hear people that are actually, that were actually impacted positively by either the conditional cash transfer and all that. Most of the time we see the optics, you know, with regards to, you know, school feeding programs, which was basically political. So that being said, it is very obvious that the social intervention program has failed. Going forward, what I would expect is the right steps taken by Mr. President, freezing this program, taking critical steps to query the critical players. And within the terms of reference, I saw audits and all that. I hope, like you asked me, if Mr. President asked me, the simple is to take it simple because 
This committee is a committee of ministers that already have work cut out for themselves. These key ministers are holding critical portfolios. Now, it turns out there's a very big issue, a crucial issue to be addressed. I guess it is because of the nature of the person in question, the minister, that has been suspended. In line with public service rule, we'll come to that. Uh, I will expect it to be, to be an intra-ministerial you know, uh, you know, uh, committee that will look into this. But that being said, to make it simple for them, I would like them to have a quick look at a dashboard impact assessment cost-benefit analysis to say how has this really impacted on the populace and then going forward to come out with a framework and a system to ensure that really the most vulnerable are impacted. And this goes also to the current administration because most of the time politicians hijack this, you know, program. So while we are looking at one side of it, we also need to look at it so that Mr. President will do a yeoman's job with this. The politicians, I hear a lot of conversations about governors. I have become a bit, you Go know... Governors, I, I, sorry, I'm not interrupting you, but, but I, I had uh, a Borono lady who is in charge of the program in Borono yeah, who yeah. said he's worked in their state, yeah. but that the challenge is that the governors want these things handed to them. That's where I'm going to, okay. Indy. Uh, most as we have governors that obviously are doing well in their states. But when we want to have a program that is overarching, is national in nature, we also, and we, we, we totally agree that it, the impact is at the subnationals, states and local government. Local government is almost not a non-existence because whatever you give the local states, the local government may not get it. Now, Mr. President needs to use that political will to ensure that the governors do not continue hijacking this process. At the end of the day, the most vulnerable don't get it. Even within the framework of this impact, you realize it is the political, you know, uh, members of political parties, let me put it that way, or political likes that actually benefit, if any. You know, as infinitesimal as that impact is, is not actually going to people who don't know anybody, by the way. So there is need for a total review in terms of impact. There must be an impact assessment for Mr. President to really know what has happened and why, why it is relevant and how it should be more relevant. And going forward, the systemic way this intervention is set up will determine the success. Because you see a lot of interference by players, which means the system is not foolproof. The system is open to a lot of uh, loopholes. And that is why it is systemically abused. We expect to see a transparent, accountable process moving forward that as much as possible will remove you know, the process from the hand of players to an automated system that will make it much more, you know... Uh, direct, uh, get direct uh, yes, to the people who exactly, need these things. And much more accountable going forward. But if it is going to be the same way again going forward, it's going to be business as well. And I tell you, for a long, a long time to come, the social investment program in a country like Nigeria will continue to be a political tool unless the president himself has decided one of the key impacts he's going to make is to ensure that the dividends of democracy reaches you know the poorest of the poor in this country that is the only way and i hope the trajectory he has taken mr president will be able to be sustained because uh, towards the end of last year in, in in this station and in my columns i mentioned and i'm very happy mr president has done that that mr president should move away from the boldness of assertions to inculcate the practicality of discipline and political will of execution if he sustains this people will fall in line including the governors because i reckon even in the next couple of weeks you will see the sixty percent slash down. I, I, was I expected to, it. I expected I, I, I to go was going to go to that. Maybe take it to take it to a uh, caller Wale. Yeah. Uh, because governance, caller Wale, I'm coming to you because governance, governance uh, has to get to the grassroots so that the dividends of democracy can get to them. So in uh, there's this question of concerning the NSIPA, the question of data, the question of who are the vulnerable. Do we have a data of people who are termed the vulnerable so we can reach them, so we can know them? Is this not important? If it is, how can we 
you know, bring up a, a working data of people. Is it difficult to do? Caller? No, it's not difficult. But unfortunately, for several years, we've all of, we've, we have always relied on uh, foreign bodies to give us or to give us our data. Uh, well, you know, uh, good enough. Kudos to the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics, uh, the National Bureau, uh, for what they've been doing lately. But uh, I think on data, we are, we, are, we are not where we should be as a nation. Uh, unfortunately, you go to different agencies, you drop the same information, you know, that you can drop, you know, just at a spot and they can all access. So first, I think there's a need for us to uh, 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 design, design, and not just our policies, but our approach to issues, responding to the complexity of our environment and the, uh, 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 and, 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 and the people themselves, because you get to some areas and you are trying to take data. You'd be shocked that uh, you know, we'd like over bloating in some places. You take, for example, uh, our, uh, uh, the, uh, the registration for uh, uh, the voters' registration. And you see, you see areas that, uh, you know, multiple registrations and all, even till date, we've not been able to clean our register to, you know, to have that integrity that you be sure that uh, those who are you know, uh, uh, on the voters' register are the actual number that should be there. So we've not even gotten there. It shows that first, the problem with the people, look at census. You see some areas that, you know, desert and numbers will come from there. You see, you know, a small village, numbers will come from there. And you wonder if, 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 if that is a true reflection. So if you want to plan, can you plan with such numbers? Of course, you can plan with them. And so the problem is both with the system and the people, the psyche, how we respond to things. So I will also agree with you that the starting point would be for us to get the data right. Because in this era where political interest will take the center stage. You see the man in power, the man, you know, who's got that influence, who prefer to put his relative there. You know, you see the members of National Assembly, they ask them, they will submit names. And many of those names are not actually the vulnerable. That is the truth. And, you know, look at what Baba Yusuf just quoted. Out of the 3.5, you know, 3.7 that was spent, trillion, the NBS said only 6.1 got it. But they only rely on the data from the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, not on the actual recipient. You look at the numbers in different states, in different locality. Can you actually say truly yeah, that that number, that that, you know, that that figure actually got what we claim that they have gotten? So I agree with you that until we get our data right, we may not be able to put this money where it rightly belongs, but we can have a structural way out. For me, I think so. If you want to reach these people, we know where they are. Now, the largest percentage of the vulnerable are in the rural areas, and predominantly, they are farmers. And so, if we design something around agriculture that can reach them better, are we not going to be fulfilling this in a more uh, productive way than giving money that will end up in the pocket of you know, a privileged few. And so for me, if we are going to drive this better, it should be partly the direct you know, transfer. And you know you have different program. You have the Jeep and a different one, the, condition, uh, the conditional you know, cash transfer. You have the school feeding and you know, others. So maybe we'd look at it very well. I've been looking at the reform that they are trying to do, and I hope that they will bring in, you know, that they'll be able to, you know, take people uh, who are very, you know, vast in that area right. to be part of that reform so that we can have a template, a work plan that will not only work for now, but also for the future, All starting right. from getting the data right. All right. If, 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 if we have time to get back to you, I will get back to you. Uh, the question of cutting cost of governance. See what the president said. The president is insistent that the notion of government wasted, the notion of recurrent expenditure being in excess, the notion of the government officials will be allowed to conduct their affairs in a way that is different from what we are asking of Nigerians. 
with respect to prudence and cost management. He says it's over. You know, uh, that is a good talk. But when you think about the fact that a National Assembly had to have SUVs that cost each about 160 million naira. Is the president playing to the gallery? Is he factoring these ones in? I think what Mr. President is doing is applying emotional intelligence to deal with a very complex, Issue. deeply embedded social, cultural, national malaise. What am I saying? Now, for you to deal with a canker worm like this, Indy, you need to be very strategic and you have a high level of emotional intelligence. He cannot come and tackle head on an institution he requires to, to, you know, to impact that change. So fine, they've gotten their budget for 2024, how they want it. But Mr. President's body language, if sustained, which I believe he will, because you know what? Mr. President has no choice but to, but to win, for, to succeed. Because at this point, the only way for him to be remembered in history is to deliver. Now, I reckon, because you see, I've said it many times and it is true, quintessential leadership has a catalytic impact, vertical, diagonal in a society. In the next few weeks, I bet you the governors will scale down the number of their you know, retinue of... of Th the, thank God you're bringing that. Yes, in. moving on from there, the National Assembly, as we know, given the antecedent of Mr. President, as a strategy that applies sometimes the strategy of influencing, sometimes the strategy of sensing, and sometimes the strategy of domination, will apply the strategy of influence to ensure that legislations that are done in a way and manner that will impact. And I reckon also the Senate president... Follow my example. Come again? The follow my example. Exactly. Now, it, it is most likely that the National Assembly will read the body language of Mr. President because, you know, with all due respect, I say that with high level due of respect, you know, in this part of the world, mostly we lead by psychophancy and reading the body language of the leader. I reckon the National Assembly will be pinching themselves during this recess. And I reckon when they come back, the Speaker and the Senate President will try to demonstrate to the populace that they are not going to be the bad guys. Because what the President has done is the strategy of influencing. Now he has thrown the ball in their court to also demonstrate they are ready, they are in tune with the realities of Nigerians, not to tell us to suffer while they are bowling for one. We, we hope they buy what you're saying. I'm going to get back to you. I want to rush it because I have less than four or five minutes. Uh, 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 the uh, Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, Beta Edu, is on suspension, was talking, uh, talking NSIP. But in some quarters, the talk is that it's larger than better. In fact, I think Senator Ndume says the President should widen the scope of this that it's not only better that is involved so that he can get to the root of the matter. Uh, better has been suspended, Shehu has been suspended, of course, Faru has been called in by the EFCC uh, briefly, you know, so he can talk on it too. What, what, what do you think? Even better, even better said, oh. before, before you come in, better said, uh, Ireland, she said that, I mean, paying 585 million into a private account, that that's the way it's done, you know, uh, you know, in ministries. That's the way it's been ongoing. And so she felt there was, some people are saying what happened to her was lack of experience. I don't know how you look at it, Kola. Honestly, I agree that first, what happened uh, you know, to her was lack of experience and the fact that she was over, over zealous to deliver and uh, uh, she wasn't following the rules. And unfortunately, you have, um, you have a system that will encourage you to feel if they don't like you. So I want to believe some things, you know, just trying to like, you know, look at the structure. Because if you look at it, since our news broke out, the 585 million. We have left the 37 billion completely relegated. And you look at some fire from some places and you wonder, 
Are we not having some deliberate amnesia in this case? Are we not also, you know, falling a fool to, you know, leave some and, be a, 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 and face one? So for me, I think she failed because she lacked experience, just like you said. However, we must look at the integrity of the system and the process. We've been saying this from time, is that you have, if you have a system that encourages this, see, um, Baba Yusuf mentioned the body language. On a national program too, I think last month in December, I was asked, you know, this same question, and I was blaming the president for what was happening at the National Assembly. And he said, no, you can't blame him. And I said the exact thing he said, is that the body language of the president matters. If when he came to the office, just, you, just the same way you said subsidy is gone, and you came in and you said, okay, we are reducing uh, the ministries. Look at today. You have 48 ministries of thereabouts. And you have, I, I read something now, you have one permanent secretary that will serve two ministries. That should tell you that we did not need the two ministries in the first instance. So all of those things, if you had done it at the initial stage, at the initial, we were not likely to see the National Assembly putting 160 million naira to buy just one car, claiming, you know, it was for whatever you know, it was meant for. So we permitted the system, we left the system there. They have been running this system from time where monies go, you know, uh, 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 go into private account for public project, even against the norms, against the rules, simply because we are allowed it. So if we are able, I, I, I mentioned that before, I've been shouting this since May 29. I was privileged to be on a national program on the 28th of May, a day before the swearing in. And I mentioned all of this. We need the reform in the system, not just, not, not just, you know, on the policy stage. You need to reform the structure. We need to reform the system in a way that you don't allow this to happen. See this. We do something that, I don't know, it is not like reverse psychology. You allow people to steal money. They take the money away before you report a few of them to the anti-corruption agency, who are also largely corrupt. I remember a, an official years back said, what he said, just steal enough. You give them that share and you will rest. So this thing is very simple. When you allow them to take it, they use that same money to fight us and even fight the anti-corruption agency. They can stay in court forever simply because they have the money already. So why don't we prevent them from stealing in the first instance? We have some systems across the world that we can copy. I think that of Finland and some countries may be helpful. You know, where you have the... Uh, Ombudsman and people that can directly look into activities while, while you are at it. You won't finish the stealing before we start running after you with, our, with the state money yeah. again. Yeah. And again, you still fight us back with the state money. So let us create a system that will discourage this stealing or that will reduce it to at least some minimal level then you will see that they won't be able to take as much away. We'll be able to free money you know, to, 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 to service the critical sector. Okay, prevention being better than care. You cannot put yam and goat together. Oh, yes, thank and, you. And say yam, should, and say goat should not eat the yam. I mean, it's, it doesn't work. It can't work. I think that's a very, very poignant point that Kola made. Stop the stealing at the source. So nobody sees what to steal. Pre just prevent it. It's, it's even costlier to fight it than it is to prevent it. I, I don't know what, what, how you agree with that. Uh, you and then the question of what are you expecting with the ESCC? Farouk is there, Beta yeah. is there, Shehu is there, and they're being uh, questioned or investigated. What do you expect after all this? You just landed in a part of paragraph of my column of yesterday, uh, Indy, with regard to this uh, proactiveness and my co-panelists mentioned it. I wrote it in my column of yesterday. You see, the rules are there, the structure is there, the system is there. It is the rot, the culture that is the issue in the... I give you two simple examples and I, 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 I called on Mr. President to, to look at that. The KPIs of the Accountant General of the Federation and the Auditor General of the Federation should include what they have saved Nigeria, what they have prevented the fraud and the criminality they have prevented from happening. What it happens is we have accountant general and auditor general that are more or less spectators on a long term match. They look left and look right and they only report after the fact. So it is either a collusion 
you know, an unholy alliance of corruption. Why? Because there is nobody at the top that is checkmating or ensuring things are done. Mr. President says he's going to run a performance, you know, driven, you know, governance framework. If he does that, a lot of this will not happen because we have robust laws. For example, like I said, if you come and your KPIs include, you don't just come and report after the fact, whether you're an auditor or an accountant, you are a decision guidance for the leaders at the top, whether president or governors. How did you allow this loop to start? It's not enough for you to mean it back to someone to say, you cannot do this. You cannot action this. There are processes and procedures to ensure that it doesn't even go out. So we had this in place. Mr. President, by body language, has demonstrated he wants to run a, you know, purpose-driven governance going forward. I can assure you, if there's consequence management, apart from performance management, and consequence management is for people that do wrong to know they have done wrong and for people to see that something happens to them, that will, that will be stopped. And I, I, with regards to the EFCC, again, Mr. President will decide how he wants this to be. In the next six months, does he want EFCC to be seen or ICPC or all the regulatory and law enforcement to be taken serious and for them to reclaim their respect? because they also have the bad eggs in their institutions, mm. or not. He has uh, CBN, former CBN governor is there, Sadia is there, and others. We will wait and see how the agency does their, their work. And then again, we have another big institution that also requires reform that is going to now close the matter, and that is the judiciary. Will they be up to their responsibilities well, if and when the matter goes to them because then Mr. President will tell you it is out of the executive's hand, it is in the hand the of the judiciary well, and so you have, uh, you know, adjournments upon adjournments and then travesty of justice as we have seen happening many times well, these on, days. Uh, on that I'm sure I'll discuss it with the panelists. What somebody, somebody said that the president can now beat his chest and say that um, people talking about judiciary, you can see uh, it's open. <laughs> they had to do their work and everybody is happy, you know, so to say. And so we're going to want to thank you so much, uh, gentlemen. Kolawole uh, Johnson, uh, uh, a due process advocate and head directorate of research and strategy act for positive transformation initiative. Thank you so much for being in the studio with me this evening. And of course, Baba Yusuf, uh, who is the uh, a strategist, policy analyst, and group chief executive officer of Global Investment Thank and you. Trade Company. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll take a break. I will be back still with this day life, the Sunday talk show. We'll discuss a busy day. That was where he landed last, and that's what we're going to be discussing next. 